right, everybody. Hello again, and welcome to part two of our uh, chapter six. This section is on the central limit theorem. And let's just review where we are step by step. This is the last section before our exam. So uh, we focused this beginning of the class on understanding descriptive statistics. And we build step by step on what we learned. So we start with raw data. These are just raw scores, just a random array of raw scores. Um, they could be IQ if we're studying intelligence or height or anxiety scores, whatever it is in a random list of, of the data we've collected. Chapter two, we talked about organizing raw data into a frequency distribution. And a frequency distribution, as we said, is a chart that has all of the possible scores in one column, and then the number of people who have that score in the column next to it. And so in that way, we organize our data. We could also turn our frequency distribution into a histogram or a bar graph, um, which would be taking the numbers and putting it into a graph. Either way, we're organizing our data. Then we can use other descriptive techniques that we learned in chapter four to describe or summarize the data. We talked about central tendency, those measures of mean, median, and mode to talk about the average score. And then measures of variability was the second half of chapter four, range, variance, and standard deviation. And those tell us about the spread, how spread apart the scores are in the distribution or how tightly clustered they are together. And if the data fall into a normal curve, we can then translate raw scores into z-scores, which is what we just did um, in the first part of this chapter. And that would be to take a raw score and standardize it, making it into a z-score. And the z-score then is on a scale of standard deviation units away from the mean. And so once we get a raw score, or excuse me, a z-score, we're able to say, uh, if we have a raw score of positive one, we know that that score is one standard deviation above the mean. And it allows us then to compare different people's scores on different um, scales. So we can compare all sorts of scores once they're standardized into z-scores. So that's where we were. And all of these concepts are really important for where we're heading after our first exam, which is to learn inferential statistics. Um, the second part of this chapter is very theoretical, quite conceptual, um, and will be quite important as we move on to inferential statistics chapter seven. It's going to build on what we've learned before, standard deviation, the ideas of populations and samples, and certainly now, especially right before our test, if you don't understand some of these concepts, this is the time to really sit back and review them. Reread, email me to ask me questions, come to office hours, whatever you need to do um, to understand these concepts. So we're going to review here samples and populations. We've talked about this before, where the population is everybody that you want to study. And a sample is a small group selected from the population. Populations are usually too large for us to test every single person in a population. So instead, we study a small sample. We pull out a group of 30 people or 50 people or 200 people, whatever the number is, um, and use that sample to tell us something about the population. But by definition, because a sample is a small group of the population, the sample provides an incomplete picture of the population. We know that as researchers and as statisticians, we know that samples aren't perfect. There's no way that a sample of 30 college students could accurately represent the entire population of college students in this country. Now our sample might do a very good job of estimating the population but it certainly won't be perfect. There are going to be aspects of the population that aren't included within our sample. And again, this is a given. We know this and we understand this as researchers and statisticians. 
And this term sampling error is a very important term. Sampling error is the error or the distance between a sample statistic and the corresponding population parameter. Oh gosh, remember these terms. Let's go back. Uh, what is a sample statistic? A, a statistic is basically a descriptive measure taken from a sample. So a sample mean, let's say, would be a statistic. If we find the uh, average, let's say, age in our sample, we call that a statistic. And then a, if we know the age of the entire population, we call that a parameter. So the mean age of the entire population would be a parameter. And the difference between our sample statistic, our estimate from our sample, and the actual population parameter is what we call sampling error. This is the error we have because we have used a sample instead of taking the whole population um, into account, instead of testing the whole population. So sampling error is a measure of the discrepancy or the difference between the sample and the population. Uh, sampling error, like I said, is the difference between our sample statistics, so maybe a sample mean, x bar, or a sample standard deviation, remember that's lowercase s, and its corresponding population parameter, which would be mu, that's the mean in a population, or sigma, sigma is the standard deviation in a population. So let's say you're a researcher and you're asked to provide the average age of students enrolled at SDSU, San Diego State University. And due to time and cost, you decide to take a sample rather than asking that question of the entire population, right? If you had to ask it of the entire population, where let's say there's 25,000 students, it would take you an awfully long time. So instead, we take a random sample of 200 students out of the 2,500. So 2,500 students is our population, and we're using a sample of 200 students. As you might imagine, there are an infinite number of possible samples. Again, we're talking theoretic, the theoretically here. There's an infinite number of possible samples um, that you could take, meaning if I have all 25,000 students' names in a giant hat, a really giant hat, in front of me, and I pull out randomly 200 names, that would be one sample. You could imagine I could put those 200 names back in the hat, mix it up, pull out another random 200 names, and now I have another random sample. I could put those 200 names back in the hat, mix it up, and again, pull out another 200 names, and that's another sample. And I could do this an infinite number of times, and each sample would be slightly different. So although there are an infinite number of possible samples, we certainly don't do that as researchers. We pick one sample. So we do a random sample, we pick out one group of 200, and that's the group we work with. But again, speaking theoretically, suppose that you know that the mean age in the population, so of all 25,000 students, is 23.5 years old. Okay, that's mu, the mean age in the population of students. Again, we typically never know this because we've never tested the population. If we did, we wouldn't need to take a sample. But again, in this kind of theoretical discussion, imagine that that is the case. And I take my first sample, sample one, where I've picked 200 names out of the hat and I have a sample of 200 students and I calculate their average age and their average age is 22.6. So this is my sample statistic, right? This is my estimate based on a sample that the average age of college students at, UC at San Diego State is 22.6 years. The difference between my sample statistic here of 22.6 and my population parameter, which I know, again, theoretically, that the average age of college students at San Diego State is 23.5, the difference between 22.6 and 23.5 is sampling error. That's the error that we have because we took a sample. I could put those 200 students' names back in 
to the half and pull out another sample of 200 and ask those 200 students how old they are and calculate an average. And let's say this time with this sample, the average age is 21.5. So this is my sample statistic, right? It's my estimate of the mean age of college students at San Diego State. My average age is 21.5, that's my sample statistic. And the difference between my sample statistic and my population parameter of 23.5 is what we call sampling error. And you can see I could do this an infinite number of times. Each time I'll get an estimate. Some are better than others, right? This one is very close, 23.8. This one is pretty far off, 32.1. Each time I'll get an estimate, they will most likely be somewhere around the population parameter of 23.5, a little higher, a little lower here or there, and that difference is sampling error. And you can see that these sample means do reflect the population parameter we didn't get, we would never get a mean age of 65 years old, right? Um, that would be very, very unlikely. That would mean that all uh, 200 people that I randomly picked uh, were 65 years or older. So although that's possible, because there probably are um, at least 200 students around the age of 65, it's unlikely they would all get chosen to be in one random sample. And I'll notice we didn't get a mean age of, you know, 15 years old or 18, or, you know, 15 years old or 10 years old. That wouldn't make any sense. So the sample statistics that we come up with do reflect the population. But of course, um, any difference between the sample statistic and the population parameter is sampling error. All right, so we're moving on to the idea of the central limit theorem. The central limit theorem is very important in statistics. It's some one of those things that I think statistics students um, cringe at when they hear the term, maybe because it has the word theorem in it. But we're going to try to make it understandable um, by the time we get through this lecture. Two very important principles that the central limit theorem is going to tell us that with repeated sampling, so what we were talking about, taking a sample of 200 in the, the case of the ages of the San Diego State students, taking a sample of 200, throwing it back in, put it, taking another sample of 200, putting those back in, taking another sample of 200. If we repeat and repeat sampling from a specific population, those sample means will approximate a normal curve. And that's going to be very important for us because there are lots of things that we know about a normal curve that we talked about um, earlier in terms of um, the distribution of scores and the 1, 2, 3 rule and all of that. So with repeated sampling, the sample means will approximate a normal curve, and I will show you that. And that the distribution of means is less variable than the distribution of individual scores, and we'll talk about that in a second. At this point, I'm going to ask you to please go to Learning Curve. There is a stats clip video called Sampling Distributions Overview and Motivation Part 1. Um, this video is in Section 6C, so it's Chapter 6, Part C, The Central Limit Theorem. And it's really going to be important for you to understand um, what we're going, on, going to talk about from here on. So please watch the stats clip video. Is going to talk about creating a sampling distribution or a distribution of sample means with fish weights, the weight of fish. Um, so please watch that and then come back to me and we will continue um, this lecture from there. Okay, so hopefully you've watched the video and that video uh, gives you a very important demonstration of one of the key principles of, well, many of the key principles of the central limit theorem. And here is an example from your book. Um, in this case, instead of fish weights, we're looking at height in inches and frequency. So again, this is a histogram. And this first graph 
is a histogram of individual scores. So this is the population of heights. And you can see that heights can be quite variable. Most people falling here around this 62, 63, 64, 65 inches. But there can be people who are much shorter. And there can be individual people who are much taller. There's quite a bit of variability here. However, this bottom graph represents a sampling distribution, or what we call a distribution of sample means. In this case, each box here doesn't represent an individual person as they did in the top graph. These are all individual people represented. In the bottom graph, these are sample means. So this here is a mean of, and I believe they were using three people. So they picked three people from the population and uh, calculated the mean and the average or the mean for those three people was 60 inches and so on and so forth. Each one of these is a sample mean. It's just like what we were talking about with the average age of students at San Diego State, where you would take an average, you would take a sample of 200, calculate the average and then throw it back in, throw that sample back in, mix it around and pick another sample of 200. In this case, we're talking about individuals with, and we're looking at height. And we would find a sample, take a sample of three, find the average height, throw it back in. Take another sample of three heights, um, take the average and throw it back in. And when you do that, you create what we call a distribution of sample means. So it's a lot of terminology in the second part of the chapter here. Um, but a distribution of sample means is just what we're saying. These are sample means, and this is the distribution. Just like the top graph is a frequency distribution, and we are talking about the frequency of individual scores. In this case, this is a distribution of sample means. We're still looking at the frequency, but we're looking at the frequency of means instead of individual scores. So that's an important thing to understand. So this would be our regular histogram that we did in chapter two. And this is what we call a sampling distribution or a distribution of sample means. Either way, these are samples instead of individuals. And this is important because typically when we do research, we study samples. We study groups of individuals. We don't usually study individual people. Okay, so we use this whole beginning of uh, our statistics class to talk about individuals and creating frequency distributions for individuals, but that was sort of the basis for us understanding um, a sampling distribution, which is really what we use in inferential statistics because we study samples rather than individuals. So the distribution of sample means is the set of means from all the possible random samples of a specific size from a specific population. That's what we just talked about. The distribution of sample means is all the means from a particular population of a specific size. And I'm going to go back here to show you that we said we were talking about means from sample size of three people. So all of these means are of a sample size of three. If we changed our mind and decided we wanted to use a sample size of 10, we would be creating a new sampling distribution. We would start again and then be finding sample means for all samples with a sample size of 10. So each sampling distribution is specific to a specific um, sample size. Okay. Once you do that and you create this distribution of sample means, again, this is theoretical. We certainly don't do this as researchers. We don't infinitely take samples and put them back in and take samples from the population and put them back in. But statisticians and mathematicians have modeled this for us and tell us that if you were to do this and create a distribution of sample means, 
This distribution has very well-defined characteristics, which we call um, or are named in the central limit theorem. So there are three pieces of information you have to learn about the central limit theorem. Again, they might look a little intimidating, but I think we'll make it so that it makes sense to you by the end of this lecture. So the three things we're going to talk about, and we will talk about each one separately, is that number one, the mean of the distribution of sample means will be equal to the population mean, mu. We'll talk about that. Um, the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means is called standard error, and here's how we compute it, and I'll show you how to do that. And the shape of the distribution of sample means tends to be normal, and it is guaranteed to be normal if either the population from which the samples are obtained is normal, or the sample size is 30 or more. Okay, and when we say sample size is 30 or more, we're talking about the number of people in each sample. So when I had sample size um, for the SDSU students being 200, well, 200 is greater than 30, so um, that fits here. We're not talking about taking 30 samples. We're talking about sample size. Number of individuals in each sample is greater than 30. Okay, this, probably, this slide probably made very little sense to you, but let's go through it. Number one, if two or more samples are selected from the same population, the two samples will have probably have different means. We showed you that. I showed you that slide earlier with the uh, age of students at San Diego State, right? You get a sample of 200. You get an average age. Let's say it's 22.6. We put those back. We take another sample of 200, and we get another average age. Let's say that is... Um, 23.8, we put that back. Each sample will be slightly different. But even though the individuals will have different samples, they'll be pretty close to the population mean. And what the um, central limit theorem tells us is that the mean of the distribution of the sample means is equal to the mean of the population of scores. So let me, sorry, go back here to the this slide. And unfortunately, I don't have the mean in front of me, but let's just say the mean in this population of scores is 64. I don't know that to be true, but let's say it is. So we would say mu is equal to 64, meaning that the population mean is 64. What the central limit theorem tells us is that the mean of this sampling distribution, or the distribution of sample means, is equal to the population mean. It is a known mathematical fact. It will always be the case. And so if I were to tell you um, the population mean, mu, is 64, what is the mean of the sampling distribution? You would know that the mean of the sampling distribution is also 64. It must be, it has to be, it will always be the case. And if I say the mean of the sampling distribution is 64, what is the mean in the population? Again, you know the mean in the population is 64. These two will always be equal. And that's the first um, tenant of the central limit theorem, that the mean of the distribution of sample means is equal to the mean in the population. Okay, so hopefully that makes sense to you. Now standard error. This is important too. This is the second piece of information from the, that the central limit theorem tells us. It tells us that, um, let me use this term here, the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means tells you something about the average distance between any mean and the population mean. And so it describes the variability of the distribution. Let me again go back here and show you what we're talking about. This population um, of scores, 
has a mean, right, and we said the mean is 64, and has a standard deviation, which we could compute. And remember, standard deviation tells us about the variability in scores. And standard deviation tells us how far, on average, any one person's score is from the mean. This sampling distribution, or the distribution of sample means down here, also has a mean, and we said that that mean is going to be the same as that of the population. And this sampling distribution also has a standard deviation, which tells us about the variability of the sample means, because remember, each box here is a mean, it's not an individual score. So the standard deviation of the sampling distribution tells us about how far on average any particular mean is from the mean of the whole distribution. And be, instead of calling this the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means, because boy, that's a long term, they change the name to what we say at what we call standard error. Standard error is just the standard deviation of this distribution of sample means down here. What do you notice about standard error? What do you notice about the distribution of the um, variability in sample means here? compared to the variability of sample means of individual scores. Hopefully what you're noticing, maybe you're talking to your computer, telling me what you're saying or what you're thinking, but hopefully what you're noticing is that there is more variability in individual scores than there is in means, in sample means the variability is smaller. The range of sample means is smaller. The lowest sample mean here is 60, and the highest is 69. Versus in individual scores, the lowest individual score was 52, and the highest was 74. That should make sense. If you were to pull any individual in terms of height out of the population, well, there are some very short people and there are some very tall people. Maybe most people are somewhere in the middle, but there is quite a lot of variability. However, once you start collecting means or averages, those very low or very high scores, those extremes go away because it'd be very unlikely to get an average a mean, a sample mean of 52 inches from this population, what would that mean? It would mean everyone in the sample would have to have a height of 52 inches. But what we see is most people are in this range here. And so even if we picked one person who is 52 inches, chances are we'd pick another two that are more average. And so the whole mean would shift and become more um, more closer to the mean. And so when you're talking about sample means and this uh, distribution of sample means, standard error is always smaller than standard deviation. The standard error or the variability in a sampling distribution is always smaller than the standard deviation of individual scores, okay? So, standard error, as I said, describes the variability of the distribution of sample means. So this is a lot of words, but hopefully now it's making sense to you. And there are two things that influence standard error how large or how small standard error is. And let's take a look at this chart here, although I haven't given you the formula. Sorry to go back here, but let me do this for one second. 
is to show you a formula for standard error. Standard error is sigma with an x bar, sub x bar. That's standard error. Remember, standard deviation is just sigma. And this is trying to tell us this is standard error. This is the standard deviation of sample means, x bar representing means. So this is the symbol for standard error. And it is defined for us in this formula of sigma, so standard deviation in the population over the square root of n, and n is the sample size. So we can calculate standard error, we can calculate the variability in the distribution of sample means using this formula, sigma over the square root of n. So given that formula, let me head back to this chart to show you the two things that will affect the size of your standard error term. So here's standard error, and now in this um, chart, they're using sigma with the subscript of a capital M. Remember, capital M can also be means, so this is standard error. And we said standard error is sigma, which is standard deviation, over the square root of n. So in this case, sigma, or the standard deviation in the population, is 10. And you can see in each line here, in each row, the 10 remains constant. So we're saying that is the standard deviation in the population. It is 10. One thing that can affect, well, there are only two things that can affect this, um, standard, the size of standard error. One is sigma, the standard deviation in the population, and one is n. Those are the only two things in the equation. So in this case, we're going to be looking at n, or the number of individuals in the sample. So let's look here at the first line. We've got standard, standard deviation, sigma is 10, and we have a sample size of 1. Well, what is 1? 1 is not a sample. It is an individual person, right? So 10 over the square root of 1. The square root of 1 is 1, so 10 over 1 is 10. And what this is telling us, us is that standard error for a sample size of 1 is 10. Well, of course it is, because that's really an individual, and we're back to looking at the variability of individual scores. And the variability of individual scores is sigma, and so these two are equal. But what happens when we actually start to take a sample? So let's say we're using a sample size of 4. If we have a sample size of 4, again, to compute standard error, in this case, 10 is the is sigma. It's remaining the same over the square root of 4. The square root of 4 is 2, so 10 divided by 2 is 5. Standard error is 5. What has happened from 1 using a sample size of 1 to a sample size of 4? Standard error goes down. The variability goes down. What if we use a sample size of 25? Well, again, in computing standard error, sigma in this case stays the same over the square root of 25, which is 5. So 10 over 5 is 2. Standard error, again, has gone down. And if we go here to the last line, 100, we use a sample size of 100. That's a pretty large sample. We take 10 a standard deviation over the square root of 100, which is 10. So 10 over 10 is 1. Again, standard error has gone down. This is called the law of large numbers, that the larger the sample size, you can see as we go up here, as in sample size gets bigger, um, uh, standard error gets smaller. There's an inverse relationship. The larger the sample, the smaller the standard error. And you can imagine that that would be the case because there is less variability the more um, observations are in your sample. The more observations, the less chance that any one extreme score um, would be that impactful. Okay. 
uh, standard error is defined as the standard deviation, like I said, of the distribution of sample means and measures the standard distance between a sample mean and the population mean, and it provides a measure of the variability or how accurately each sample mean represents the population mean. I need to go back here for a second and tell you the other thing that can influence how variable or stable the sample means are. So what's the other thing that can influence standard error? We said number of participants. So the larger the number of participants, the smaller standard error. The other thing that can influence how variable or stable the sample means are is variability in the population. So back here, variability in the population is represented by this 10, in this case, which is standard deviation in the population. And if standard deviation in the population gets bigger, let's just use a, let's go here with a sample of 25. Um, let's just say we're staying with a sample of 25, but in one case, the standard deviation in the population is 10. And in another case, the standard deviation in the population is 100. So in the case that it's 10, 10 divided by the square root of 25, that gives us 2. But in the case where this is 100 divided by the square root of 25, which is 5, 100 divided by 5 is 20. Standard error goes way up. So the issue is the more variable the population is, the more variability you see in the population, so if it's heights, or age or IQ, if there's more variability in the population, that will be reflected in standard error. There will be more variability in your standard error as well. So the larger sigma is, and sigma is this numerator part of the fraction, the larger sigma is, the larger standard error is. The larger n is, or sample size is, which is the denominator of the fraction, the larger n is, the smaller um, standard error is. Last thing to talk about, which is the third part of the um, central limit theorem, is the shape of the distribution of sample means tends to be normal, and it's guaranteed to be normal if either the population for which the samples are obtained is normal, or the sample size is 30 or more. So going back to this same graph here, if this original population is normal, normally distributed, remember bell-shaped, unimodal, symmetrical, then your distribution of sample means is also guaranteed to be normal. Okay, those two things will happen. But the interesting thing is that if your population is not normal. Maybe it's bimodal. It's got two modes. Maybe it's very skewed. Um, and this was shown in the video that you watched, the stats clip video with the fish. If the distribution, um, the individuals in the population, the distribution is not normal, your sampling distribution will still be normal if you have sample sizes of greater than 30, which is why we typically do studies on samples of greater than 30. It's very unlikely to do a study where we say, oh, let's see if this new treatment will work for um, anxiety, and we're going to test it on five people, and if it works on those five people, we'll say it works in the population. Well, no, we typically don't do that. Instead, we use a sample of 100 or 200 or something like that, um, or 50 even, something greater than 30, because if we do, we are guaranteed that our sampling distribution will be normal. And if you remember back to the beginning of this chapter, we know some very important things about a normal distribution, one of which is that we can convert now sample means into z-scores, because if it's a normal distribution, we can create z-scores which is the last part of this chapter. Let's say we're doing a study on IQ. Um, oh, study on IQ, which has a mean of 100 in the population, 
and a standard deviation of 15. Well, first, let's see if we compute standard error. So standard error, if we know that the mean is 100, standard deviation is 15, n equals 25. How do we compute standard error? Well, remember standard error is sigma over the square root of n. In this case, we know the standard deviation or sigma is 15 over the square root of n, square root of n in this case 25, the square root of 25 is 5, and so that's three points. Three is our standard error, and we're saying just by chance, a typical sample mean drawn at random from this distribution will be three points away from the average of 100. That's telling us the average distance of any sample of 25 taken from the population. The variability or standard error is three. All right, so to review here, if this chart represents uh, the, pop the distribution in the population, and this is the sampling distribution, so this represents sample means of a certain size sample, let's say 25 or 50 or whatever it is, what do we know? We know that whatever the population mean is, is the, will be equal to the mean of the sampling distribution, or the mean of the sampling distribution will be equal to the mean of the population. So if you know one, you definitely know the other. The other thing is we know that um, the sampling distribution will be normally distributed if either the population is normally distributed, which in this case it is, or if the population is not normally distributed, but you take, you're talking about samples of greater than 30, then you know that this will be normal. The, sample, the distribution of sample means will be normal. And lastly, standard error is the term for the variability in the distribution of sample means here. And we know that standard error will always be smaller than the standard deviation in the population by an exact amount that we can compute. We know the formula standard error is standard deviation in the population over the square root of n. And that is the central limit theorem. Those are the three things you need to know. But because we said that the distribution of sample means will be normal, we can compute a z-score for any sample mean. And we can use, we'll learn about the unit normal table in chapter um, seven. The procedures for computing z-scores for sample means are pretty much the same as what we used for individual scores. However, the only big difference is um, you've got to use standard error in standard deviate, instead of standard deviation. So let me show you how this works. If you're talking about trying to find a z-score for a sample mean, this is the formula. Sample mean minus population mean mu over standard error of the mean. If you compare this formula to our z-score formula we used before, for a specific score, so for somebody's individual score, that was x here instead of mean. So we were looking at x minus mu, so same thing, you see there for an individual um, score would be x, or for a sample mean would be m minus mu. And then when we're talking about an individual score in the population, we use the measure of variability for an individual score and that is sigma, or standard deviation. But when we're talking about sample means, the correct measure of variability is standard error. So sample mean minus population mean over standard error. Then their z-scores work just the same way they did before. A positive z-score is a sample mean that is greater than the population mean. A negative z-score means that the sample mean is smaller than the population mean. All right, so the distribution of means, this is what we just said. The mean of the distribution of sample means 
will be equal to the mean of the population. Standard deviation of the distribution tends to be less than the standard deviation of the population, and we call it standard error when we're talking about the standard deviation of the distribution of sample means. And here is how we compute standard error, sigma over the square root of n. So let's try to compute a z-score for a sample mean. We take a sample of 25, this should say physics, professors, and find their mean IQ to be 117. We know the population mean for IQ is 100 with a, stand, with a population standard deviation of 15. So find the z-score for this sample mean and interpret the results. So we want to try to find a z-score for this sample mean of 117 compared to this population of 100. We know the standard deviation in the population and we're talking about a sample size of 25. Try to put everything we've done so far together and find the answer to this. Find the z-score for me. Pause here if you would. If you've paused and worked it out, we have our z-score formula of sample mean minus population mean over standard error of the mean. So plug in what we know. The sample mean is 117, so our physics professors have an average IQ of 117, minus the population mean, which is 100. We know IQ in the population is 100, over standard error of the mean. Now, we don't have standard error of the mean, but we can compute it. Standard error of the mean, remember, is sigma 15, right here, over the square root of n, over the square root of 25. So 15 over the square root of 25, which is 5, gives you standard error of 3. So moving on, we have 117, the sample mean, minus 100, the population mean, over standard error, which is 3, which gives you 17 divided by 3, or 5.67, a z-score of 5.67, which tells us that this sample of physics professor's IQ is 5.67 standard deviations above the average IQ score in the population. So what does that tell you? They are very, very smart. All right, I hope you are um, getting a grip on this chapter. There's a lot of information in here, and I do understand that. Um, feel free to watch this again, keep reading, email me, however I can help, and, um, and good luck. I'll talk to you later. See you later. Bye. Oh, how about I have, have end with this last um, symbols? If you're still here, maybe you've turned it off, but if not, um, here were some symbols. Um, population mean, mu, population standard deviation, sigma, the mean of the sampling distribution, mu sub m, okay, um, talking about the mean of the distribution of sample means, and standard error, sigma with a sub m or sub x bar, meaning the standard deviation in the distribution of sample means, and again, we call that standard error. All right, now I have finished, and again, good luck studying. Let me know if you have questions. Bye.